All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. Uh, pretty exciting to teach uh, this efficient ML.ai class again. Um, I'm Professor Sung Han. Very nice to meet you all. Uh, so we will learn together uh, the tiny ML and efficient deep learning computing. So let me do a first quick introduction of myself. I'm Sung Han. I got my uh, undergrad from Tsinghua in 2012. I grew up in uh, northeast part of China where Song actually means the pine tree. There's a lot of snow similar to Boston. So a lot of pine tree over there. And coincidentally, uh, when I did my PhD at Stanford, the logo is also a pine tree. So I did a, spent a five amazing years in the West Coast uh, at Stanford with Professor Bill Daly, where I worked on model compression and acceleration I uh, got a Bitwise paper award, and one of the paper actually ranked top five cited papers in the 50 years of computer architecture conference called ISCA. So uh, we'll teach those techniques, very fresh, very new, um, how to accelerate neural networks, how to make your uh, neural network run faster, more efficient. So during my PhD, I also co-founded a startup called D5 Tech, where I was the co-founder and chief scientist. Later, it was acquired by uh, Zilinx, now part of AMD. Uh, I will, in this class, I'll also talk about some of the entrepreneurship experiences and how to apply this modern uh, research, this cutting edge research to have real world impacts in industry. Uh, some awards like Innovators in the 35 Career Award, Sloan Fellowship, and at MIT, I co-founded another startup called OmniML uh, to commercialize some of the efficient deep learning computing techniques that we will introduce in this, call, in this course. So you will learn all the secret sauce from the startup by doing the homework. Right? <laughs> and it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, <laughs> five lives. So we developed very carefully how to make it not too hard but also make sure you learn the stuff, right? Um, Google Colab, very minimal setup, spend minimum efforts, but to learn most of the stuff from this course, okay? So last year we had four uh, labs and the students mentioned the labs are too easy. So I, <laughs> indeed, we, we try to make you learn, learn stuff, not try to uh, make you feel hard. So we try to, uh, make sure uh, you spend the time on the right place. And especially this year, uh, this large language model, diffusion model, gaining so much momentum. So I think it makes sense to design new labs for you to experience on yourself, how to deploy a large language model locally on your laptop. So that's why I increased the lab from four to five. Hopefully that will give you a fun experience after writing these five labs, you will have a large language model, which is Llama 7 billion parameter model deployed locally on your laptop, which will be pretty cool. All right, so some introduction about the background. Why do we need model compression? Why do we need to make AI more efficient? So uh, this figure shows uh, the trend of the supply and the demand of AI computing for the past uh, five to six years, right? So this uh, this green uh, this green line shows um, the computing capacity in modern GPUs. Uh, this red line shows the model size, the number of parameters in these uh, language models, right? We can see it grow very fast from like 0 0.05 billion parameters all the way up to 330, 530 billion parameters, which is growing at a much faster rate than the hardware uh, can offer, right? So this is the demand of AI computing. This is the supply of AI computing. And the gap will just become larger if without model compression. Right? So we need to learn those techniques, how to reduce the computing so that we can efficiently and make uh, the future of AI more scalable. So rather than tuning and then right, inference, we are, we are going to introduce the techniques, how to compress the model, how to reduce uh, the complexity of the model 
by, by pruning sparsity quantization and also the efficient inference hardware and systems that can implement such compressed model so that you don't have to decompress it. You can directly run the sparse model, the low precision model uh, efficiently on your device. And this line of technique is getting super popular in the recent years. As you can see, the number of publications about pruning and sparsity uh, is growing uh, super fast for the uh, past few years. And also it has real world impact, uh, influenced the design of NVIDIA Ampere sparse tensor core, uh, where you can get uh, 2x uh, if uh, more uh, flops with sparsity. So in this uh, first lecture, I'm going to introduce several amazing progress of modern deep learning computing across vision models, language models, and also multi-model models, and show the effectiveness and how powerful it is, and also highlight how much computing is behind it's under the rug, and why we need lightweight and fast machine learning models. Let's start with vision models. So let's start by talking about ImageNet. Right? ImageNet is consists of a thousand class uh, different uh, images. And then this is the year when I started my PhD. Um, AlexNet just came where it, um, it started this modern deep learning era where uh, the error rate drastically in decreased uh, with the help of large scale data set like ImageNet and also the powerful GPUs and also uh, advanced algorithms from AlexNet to GoogleNet to ResNet, et cetera, right? But there's no free lunch. Such a higher accuracy, higher accuracy comes at the cost of more computation, right? So the higher accuracy, the more computation is needed. So there's not no free lunch. And the size of the circle indicates how much parameter, how much number of parameter is needed um, to run this uh, for this model. Right. Some of them are actually are pretty big. Um, so uh, what we will learn in this lecture is how to push the frontier, right? reduce the computing right? from um, like nine billion max, okay, only to less than one billion max. Okay, so this is work from one of our TAs, uh, Han Cai. Uh, maybe Han can give an introduction about yourself. Yeah, uh, so hi, hi, my name. Um, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Kai and uh, I will be the teaching assistant of this course. Yeah, we'll continue the course. And uh, yeah, if you have any question about the course and the labs, yeah, feel free to reach out to me or Jin. We will be, yeah, always ready. Okay, and uh, Jin, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, oh yeah, all right. Yeah. Come to the front. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Jimmy. I'm currently a fifth year PhD student working with Song. So um yeah, I'm glad to be here uh, today to, to help with the class. So recently I'm working on large language models and how to improve its efficiency and scalability. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah, thanks. Great, great. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So we will have Ji and Hai for the two amazing TAs and we'll have uh, office over every Thursday after the class. Okay, so our goal is to reduce the computing, well, improve the accuracy, right? So that you can efficiently deploy them at lower cost. And recently there are a lot of amazing applications with uh, efficient vision perception. And for example, on the iPhone, now we can uh, have many categories of photos. Some of them are lakes, cliffs, geysers, okay? Doing such rec recognition. Uh, on your phone to classify your photos, but the phone has limited um, po computing power right? and limited computing uh, budget. So we need to make the model small, make the system efficient so that it can run it locally on the phone. Right? So here is uh, uh, classifying different uh, different people, including here. And also it's, I can classify uh, different scenarios, the persons, and also this, this is work from our lab, also from Han, uh, which is doing um, on-device pose estimation, which is purely running, everything is running locally um, on the phone with a very limited computational budget. 
and we go even smaller. The phone still have like 10 watts of computing, right? Take a few um, hundred dollars, right? How about on a microcontroller that takes maybe only three, five dollars? Those kind of IoT devices are everywhere, right? Can we further shrink the model and improve the efficiency of our inference engine so that we can run um, this um, person recognition and also person detection demos um, applications on microcontrollers? Right? So this is a phase and mask detection. This is work from our TA. G, uh, called MCUNet, uh, which is a system and algorithm co-design to run uh, these um, AI models locally on microcontrollers in person detection. Imagine you're sitting at home and want to detect, uh, you're away from home and want to detect whether some strangers is in the home, then we can have such uh, tiny ML applications running locally without having to upload your videos on your home uh, to the cloud. Not only inference, we'll also teach how to do on-device training to customize your models. And since AI systems, we want to constantly um, update our model according uh, to the new data collected from the sensors, including uh, both the image data and also the voice data, speech data, et cetera. Right? So on these edge devices, uh, we don't want to tr always transfer the data to the cloud due to privacy issue or sometimes we don't have connection to the internet. Uh, so how do we fine tune the model locally on the edge, okay? Which will give us better privacy, lower cost, customization, and enable such lifelong learning, always on learning capability, right? But that is not easy. <laughs> Training is more expensive than inference. It's hard to fit on limited hardware memory, right? So uh, I'm gonna show we are going to learn techniques uh, such as on device training and under 256 kilobytes of memory uh, so that we can do even training on a microcontroller, uh, which is a Cortex M7, uh, which has only 320 kilobytes of flash RAM and only one megabyte, only one megabyte of flash. Imagine what you can do with only one megabyte. We can do training. So um, the screen. Uh, is um, is pretty big, but actually the microcontroller is very small and pretty cheap. So we initialize the model to detect a person versus no person. Actually, this is completely wrong uh, because the model is uh, randomly initialized. Uh, so it cannot detect person versus no person. Right? And then later we are going to feed it with some images and the labels uh, synchronously so that we can perform on-device training. So now we are feeding it with the ground truth class, zero versus one, person versus no person. And we can train it actually um, with about 1.7 frames per second on such a tiny microcontroller, only one megabyte of flash. So fast forward a little bit, it takes about 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So I'm gonna fast forward so that we can see the results. Now the training is done. Uh, we can do um, classification now. So person versus no person can be uh, correct, correctly uh, distinguished. So the inference runs about 3.2 frames per second. And in this class, we are gonna teach you uh, the techniques, how to compress the model, okay, and how to uh, write the efficient inference engine on ARM uh, processors um, so that you can have such fast speed. Okay, and let's see the generalization capability we uh, pointed to a student to detect there's no person, now there is a person. Okay, so the trained model works very successfully uh, in the real world. So this is about on device training. Um, and recently, um, there is a big trend to be able to incorporate prompt uh, into uh, image recognition tasks, such as segmentation. Right? So we can give a point, point of interest, and then uh, this segment anything can segment the objects that you are interested in. 
not only just one prompt, we can also feed it with a bunch of prompts, right? So here we can uh, do the segmentation for a lot of buildings simultaneously. However, this is not free lunch. It seems very amazing, but it cannot run on a laptop. So actually, um, it runs about a couple of images, like 12 images per second, even on a uh, large cloud GPU due to the uh, the vision transformer, the VIT, which we are going to introduce in this lecture. What is vision transformer? Why it's super powerful and why it's super uh, uh, complex? That is the front end. So given a pre, uh, pre trained no, image, now they have pre-stored, extracted the feature for a bunch of images, so you can even run it on the browser. But extracting the feature, given a new image, takes a lot of time to run. Usually we wanna uh, run it on new images rather than just prepared images. Uh, so we have we are gonna introduce some acceleration techniques, uh, the work from Han, um, about called efficient VIT. Okay, how to accelerate those vision transformers from 12 images per second to 800 images per second, okay, without losing accuracy. But it's an amazing that we can make it blazing fast and also while well preserve the accuracy, uh, like segmenting the, the cloth, segmenting the floor, here is uh, the floor as well. Okay. Uh, some more examples in the autonomous driving scenario, segmenting the road, um, the person's had and the car okay, from 12 images per second to 842 images per second. Accelerating segment anything by 70 times. Okay, so we are going to learn the techniques in a later part of this lecture. All right, so far, um, all that we talk about, what is the common property? They are discriminative models, right? Given an image, predict the label, predict the mask, right? Tell me what it is. Tell me what is the bounding box, right? So those are called discriminative models, right? So recently um, with the advancement of deep neural networks algorithms, generative model is getting really powerful. And we can not only um, describe this in the image, but also generate images from, from noise, right? Uh, we can feed it with a, language prompt such as here teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals and as mad scientists and here we can have the uh, uh, generate generate such image here a bowl of soup as a planet in the universe as a 1970s uh, poster right so um it can generate such image versus the last one a photo of an astronaut riding a horse on Mars. Right? So this is achieved um, by uh, these large generative models. Although it's pretty powerful, the uh, effect is pretty amazing. It's super costly. Training this stable diffusion, one of such generative models, costs 60, uh, 600,000, more than half a million dollars to train, super expensive. Uh, that costs 256 A100 GPUs uh, and taking 150K hours to treat very slow, very costly, and we need to make it fast. So in our lab, we worked on a couple of projects. Bring uh, some questions. You can uh, reference the link below. I don't have it top of my mind. Uh, we are going to introduce both efficient training and efficient universe. So some of our work called uh, GAN compression can reduce uh, the computation by nine to 21 X uh, truly, right? This original computing, this is um, the computing um, number of max after computing. Okay? And we can accelerate this trans translation from horse to zebra Okay. Previously, uh, this translation uh, using cycle GAN is running at about 12 frames per second, very slow. But after GAN compression, we can run at 40 frames per second. 
um, with a uh, similar or even better quality, lower F FID score. So this is another work from G, uh, efficient image generation. We want to run uh, this photo editing locally on our laptops or even tablets, which has limited computing power, right? Um, so this is the original version, pretty slow. We can make the lady smile, make her look younger by just sliding the bar. Right? <laughs> Everybody wants this, look younger and smile. <laughs> but it's slow, three seconds. Can we make it fast? So uh, we'll talk about how to uh, design a once for network work from home. Uh, train a super uh, network, and then you can get a smaller sub network and only run the sub network when you are doing uh, the photo editing. Right? So now it becomes much faster, you can make her smile and hardly tell the quality and spike degradation. Okay? But later we can finalize to run the full model. Okay? And then we can change the hair color. And then finally, we can click the finalize button to run this full model to give a high quality. Uh, image. Okay, so this is available on GitHub as well. Feel free to download to make your girlfriend look younger or look yourself. <laughs> Smile or look look younger as well. All right, so we'll learn those techniques just to help motivate how exciting it is to take the class. Uh, one question: Are you running the large subnet, or are you running the the, the full model will be finalized. That was clear. We will clear, click finalize. We are running the full model since that's the final step. What was the large subnet for? You can run a larger one or a smaller one depending on the computing it's capabilities. Trade -off. Yeah, speed and quality trade off, just like in this example, right? We can run the full model and we can run a smaller model, which is five times smaller, right? Um, so the bar is indicating how much computing. We are um, we are spending um, on the image generation. So the top four images are all generated. They are not real. Okay, we can reduce it up to like five point two x, and you can hardly tell uh, the uh, the degradation of the fidelity. So we are going to learn this once for all technique okay, to train a large a large super network and obtain. Uh, smaller sub networks that can preserve the quality and reduce the computing. Okay, so we can not only generate the full image, but also we can uh, do in painting. Okay, so what's the difference between in painting and out painting? Okay, so in painting is we can mask a portion of the image. For this grassland, we mask a portion of that, and we are going to give a text prompt, a photograph of a horse on a grassland, okay? So this is original uh, image. This is the, uh, the masked one, which is uh, masked by about 11.6%, okay? Um, and then this is the original uh, stable diffusion, okay? It's taking about 1,855 giga max to run. Okay, 369 milliseconds. Well, using our sparsity technique, since we only mask only 11% of the pixels, so why do we run, need to run the full generation, right? Can we sparsely run generation only the location we masked? Okay, so by using sparsity, we can reduce computing to 514 uh, gigabytes, which is 3.6 times smaller than runs. 95 milliseconds rather than 369 milliseconds. Is the number of max like the most useful way to quantify the efficiency? Very good question. We are going to introduce the metrics. Max is not the a good metric. Latency and memory is a good metric. So you should look at the actual speed up, okay, uh, rather than the uh, reduction of max. Uh, Mac reduction does not always translate to speed up. Sometimes you are bottlenecked by the memory. Verify what a Mac is. Um, yeah, we'll introduce that in the second lecture. Mac stands for multiply and accumulate. Do a multiplication and uh, an add, that's a Mac. Yeah, multiply and accumulate. 
So you're talking about the, the speed up, but you're talking about comparable hardware. Same, same hardware. Um, NVIDIA RTX 3090 GPU. Okay. Very good questions. Um, all right, and then I see a, another one. This is a, a beach. Then we want to uh, draw a coconut tree on the beach, beach. and then uh, generate um, a fantasy beach landscape trending on our station. The original stable diffusion plus SD edit uh, takes up uh, similarly 369 milliseconds. Well, we can uh, reduce it to uh, 76 milliseconds since we are only editing this part of the image so we can do the update sparsely. So sparsity is one of the key content we are going to learn. We are going to spend two lectures, actually two lectures talking about sparsity. All right, so far what we talk about is they are non-existing content that was generated, right? Can we generate something customized in your life? Like Song Han, myself riding a horse. If you feed this prompt, uh, to me, the journey is going to generate something like this. It doesn't look like me, right? <laughs> so can we create personalized image that look like yourself, look like your friend, look like your pet, etc. Okay. Of course, we can we can do that. Existing work, um, such as Dream Booth, um, needs fine tuning, okay, to fine tune the model uh, to learn a new subject. Okay, they are computationally expensive. Okay, and we can, uh, uh, or the generate body subject images quite poor, right? Like Newton and Einstein, if you want to uh, generate them together, um, they are going to look like each other rather than Newton and Einstein. Okay, and sometimes it will overfit the reference images, like. Uh, Fifi is on my PhD thesis committee, and a woman riding a horse um, without a uh, proper uh, technique, it will not generate riding a horse. It overfits uh, the content image. Uh, we are going to talk about techniques that can generate those uh, photorealistic images okay, without, without having to fine tune the model. Okay, so this is another uh, principle in this lecture, right? This kind of high level algorithmic, algorithmic domain specific optimizations for efficiency improvement. Okay. And we can uh, generate multiple uh, images okay. in different scenarios. Uh, and I actually we build a demo here uh, for fast composer. Um, so we put Jensen and Lady Gaga, we can say a man, a woman uh, sing together and only using one 2080 Thai GPU Okay, not only 2D images, but also 3D objects from natural language uh, description, right? So as you can see, this is far less as good as the 2D image generation, right? Um, but it's still making good progress, some initial good progress of generating 3D objects. And not only uh, static 2D images, but also videos, okay? Multiple frames, okay? Um, so this is the work uh, from Google Research. Generate uh, like pandas, uh, ship, these. Okay. However, this is super computationally heavy. The model size um, is five point six billion parameters. Pretty big. Maybe some of you, your MacBook has only like eight to sixteen gigabyte of memory. Uh, just run this model. The model itself, not to mention the activations, takes. Uh, 5.6 uh, billion parameters. So all these examples, uh, the sole purpose of mentioning so many amazing demos is to give you uh, an idea how much computing is actually behind uh, these amazing uh, work. And it's super crucial to learn how to compress it, make it run faster, make it more efficient, so we can actually deploy them and exploit them in real world scenario. Okay, so let's switch gear from 2D vision to 3D vision. Okay, we are about a, a third over the journey, so uh, it'll be pretty exciting. So, deep learning helps the machine to perceive the surrounding environment, right? This is a, uh, 
uh, demo from uh, Waymo, right? Uh, which has launched the self-driving car in San Francisco, uh, both Waymo and Cruise, uh, um, one or two months ago, which is pretty cool. Even during the night, by utilizing both the camera sensor and also the uh, LiDAR sensor, okay, they can perceive the surrounding objects with very high accuracy. Okay, even across in this crowded streets, okay, very complex traffic condition, roads, bicyclists, all the stuff, right? But running these perception algorithms is pretty computing expensive. We definitely don't want to have a whole trunk of workstations, right? It's pretty hot. It's not. It's not safe, right? It's expensive, draining a lot of power, shortening the mileage, uh, the the distance you can drive with the same battery, right? So we've been working on a bunch of efficient techniques. This is from our lab uh, called a fast LiDAR net. So LiDAR is a very important sensor in autonomous driving car. If you see something rotating on top of the car, that's the LiDAR, okay? So LiDAR can emit uh, several beams, 64 beams, 128 beams, 32 beams, and get reflected so you know the distance you know, the 3D information, okay? But that computing is not hardware friendly because they are sparse. The generated uh, signal is called point cloud, like a cloud of points, okay? which is very sparse. You don't have to learn those details. We are gonna cover them in detail about it's point cloud, but just they are super computing expensive, but we, uh, we will teach techniques that can make it run a lot faster from uh, five frames, uh, per second, all the way to uh, 47 frames per second. They can drive a car. This is in the rural area, suburban area of Boston. We can just drive it in the road. Not only a single sensor, but also multiple sensors. Okay? Um, if you uh, look into a modern um, self-driving car, usually there are many cameras in the front, in the back, in the left, on the right. Uh, back left, back right, etc. Okay, so how do we fuse uh, the information from multiple sensors, but still fit the limited computing computing hardware, like the Jason Ori? Okay, this is what it looks like. You don't want to have a whole trunk of computers, but you want to have something like this, which is a current uh, advanced uh, ADAS hardware platform developed by NVIDIA called NVIDIA Ori, Jason Ori, um, Ori platform. How do we fit so many sensors from different modalities, both the camera modality and also the LiDAR modality, both the dense image and also the sparse point cloud, right? So um, we design a work called the BEB fusion, stands for bird eye view fusion. Okay, so how do we fuse them? We choose um, the bird eye view, like look as if you are a bird looking, looking down, right? Assume there's not a car uh, stacking on top of another car, right? So in the bird eye view space, we can do the uh, EV map segmentation, a bird eye view map segmentation, where is the lane, where is the drivable area, where is the crosswalk, and also the 3D object detection. Okay, and everything here can fit a JSON orient, very small box. Okay, and later this becomes uh, one of the reference design uh, by NVIDIA with its customers. Um, autonomous driving. Okay, so we'll have a lot of hands-on uh, knowledge how deep learning is actually real used and deployed in the real world. All right, so we start finish the first part of the journey, then um, let's dive into the second part, which is language. Okay, uh, it's four ten. Uh, let's take a Five, five. Welcome back. It's uh, four fifteen. Let's continue the journey from vision models to language models and talk about large language model and chat GPT. So chat GPT and large language model are getting super powerful. Um, can produce this human-like text based on the past conversation, and have a lot of applications. Right. For example, here I can actually please draft a short description for our course. ML and efficient deep learning computing. And it's going to say the title, the course description, um, unleash the power of tiny machine learning and efficient deep learning computing. 
uh, participants will have a solid grasp of TinyML, uh, efficient learning models, and also give a lot of uh, realistic uh, description about what a TinyML course should look like. However, uh, the chat GPT is very computationally heavy, right? So for example, sometimes chat GPT is at capacity. Uh, we are experiencing certain high demand, high height as we work on scaling our systems. Uh, we will talk about techniques that can scale up, uh, how to scale up the deep learning, okay? For distributed training and also scale down deep learning to make it faster and smaller for inference. Okay? So um, here, GPT-4. Uh, currently has a cap of 50 messages um, for every three hours. Right? Can we lift such constraints by making the model smaller, make it faster, make it cheaper? It can not only generate human language, but also computer language, right? Um, Copilot, uh, GitHub Copilot, can generate very good coding suggestions based on the context. So it to ignore the lines, parse the date, for example, give us some examples, and then it will generate the code. Okay. But sometimes we are concerned about this because if you work for a company, company don't always let you to upload all the contacts to the cloud, right? Everything has to stay, stay local. You cannot upload everything to a third party. Okay. Not only on the cloud, but also mobile devices and lots of applications for natural language processing, uh, such as neural machine translation that can translate um, between languages. And that is now even available on, on iPhone. If you can, uh, you can also run it offline, right? Even without the internet, translating an uh, image to Japanese, for example. Uh, we also uh, worked on a project called Light. Uh, transformer, which we will learn in this lecture, to reduce the computing, reduce computation about transformers. So we'll also introduce what is a transformer? What is the architecture of the transformer? Uh, why so many people talk about transformer, but how exactly that is? What is the QKV? What is the attention? What is the KV cache? And we introduce those techniques um, and introduce several techniques like transformer, and quantization that can reduce uh, the model size uh, by like 18 times. Well, fully, very well preserving uh, the green line is the accuracy. We'll learn those techniques to squeeze uh, those natural language processing tasks. Very recently, there's amazing phenomena and capability uh, for this large language model, right? Which is zero shot and few shot uh, learning. Okay, so what is zero shot learning? Um, the model predict the answer given only a natural language description of the task. It's a general model. It is not specifically trained on English to French translation, but if you give it a prompt, translate English to French and feed it to the model, give it a, like um, the English, it's going to give you the answer in French. Uh, in French. Okay. And what is few short learning and also in context learning. So in addition to the task description, the model sees a few examples of a task. Okay? For example, the task description here is translated from English to French. I'm not training a specific model just for English to French translation. The model is a general purpose foundation model. Okay? But I can tell it to a specific task by giving it a few examples someone can speak French, can uh, judge if it's correct. Okay. Um, give it a three examples, and then give it a fourth question, cheese, and let it translate. Okay, so this is in context learning, give it some context. These are some examples, and then the model will have a better prediction than just zero shot. Okay. So this is not free lunch either. Okay. The model has to be pretty big. And as the model gets bigger, uh, the accuracy is actually better, right? So this is the zero shot accuracy, okay? And then this is one shot, and this is um, few shots, more than one, okay? So give a, a few more examples, the model is gonna perform better, but parameter is a big headache. Another cool example, okay? Which is chain of thought, 
Okay, so we can give it a prompt. Prompt is the input to the model. Okay, we can give it a prompt here. Um, for example, Roger has five tennis balls. Okay, he buys two more cans okay? of tennis balls. Each can contains three tennis balls. How many tennis balls does he have now? Okay, it's eleven because two or five plus two times three that's eleven. And then um, this is the example, right? This is one of the techniques we just described. So here we give it a, a task a description, and then we show uh, an example, right? In the zero shock, and this is one shock. Give it one example, and give it another question. The cafeteria had 23 apples. If they use 20 to make lunch, and by bought six more, how many apples do they have? The answer is 27 is wrong. So what should be the correct answer here? Simple math, grad school class. <laughs> I might who can answer this question. <laughs> 23 minus 20 plus six, nine. nine. Correct, good. All right, unfortunately, the large language model cannot catch up, right? The answer is 27. How do we make it smarter? So we should not only give an example, right? this is an example, right? Uh, but we also teach it, what is the chain of thought? How did we, uh, how should we think about it? What is the rationale? Roger had five balls by two ball can each by three. It says Roger started with five balls. He okay? started with five balls. And then two cans of three uh, cans each. Uh, in six tennis balls, so five plus six is 11, and the answer is 11. To give it a, the, the, the rationale, the chain of thought, how do we arrive at this answer, rather than just giving this answer as a, as a one shot, right? And after that, let's give it another try, right? The cafeteria has 33 apples, it's in the tiny apple, six more, what is the number of apples, okay? And the model can finally give a very good answer. It's in, it's in the cafeteria has 23 apples. Originally, they used the 20 to make lunch. So they had 23 minus 20, five plus 20 is 11, okay? Very similar. And they bought six more apples, so they have three plus six is nine. And now we can follow uh, this chain of thought to give you the correct answer and get smarter, right? So what is amazing about this? We never changed, we never trained the model by changing the parameter. We didn't change any parameter. This is just feeding it with a smart prompt, right? That's why people are saying, ChatGPT created a new job called prompt engineering, right? Mm -hmm. These are all about prompt engineering. Just give it a smarter prompt, like giving it a one shot of example again, okay? and make the, not only the example, but also the chain of thought, okay? To make it a smarter. Unfortunately, huge computation complex, such emerging effects, okay? Such um, emerging effects only, is only possible when you have a really big number of parameters, okay? Like 175 billion parameters, or even the palm, one, uh, 540 uh, billion parameters, okay? So this is the middle school math word problems, okay? To see the solve rate, okay? So, um, only when the model uh, is pretty big, then you can have a, a good accuracy, sometimes matching um, this prior supervised uh, bias accuracy, okay? So it comes at the cost of large model size. And what exactly does it cost to train these models, okay? So in the end of this lecture, I will give you a lab tour to show the powerful GPU machines um, that is used to train these large language models. Okay, so this is a screenshot. Uh, this is a picture of my lab's server. Okay, um, the NVIDIA GPUs. So this is the one rack, and we have a couple of them. Okay, um, I will give you a tour in the uh, in the middle of the lecture. And this is a, a infinity band switch that connect multiple machines so that it can act as a super big one giant GPU. Uh, each cable is a few thousand dollars, very <laughs> expensive cable. So this would be about 200 gigabit, uh, gigabit per second. Uh, the state of the art is actually 400 gigabit per second. So 
area is just moving so fast. I just bought the machine one year ago and it immediately become outdated. <laughs> and now each A100 node is taking a quarter million dollars. So you can see how important it is for efficient different computing. And it's not easy to bridge the gap between the supply and demand. So we also innovated some techniques to shrink the model, make it easier, make it smaller. Um, this is, we'll uh, introduce this technique called static sparse attention to token pruning. So we can prune, reduce, and remove a lot of redundant words in the sentence so that you can still understand the language uh, correctly. Like this example, as a visual trick, the film is almost perfect. And the task is to classify the sentiment uh, of this sentence, which is widely used in treating. Um, we can remove a lot of redundant word to make it as treat film perfect, prune it down to high tokens, or further prune it to only two tokens, film perfect. And we can still understand, oh, this is a positive sentiment. Okay, so how do we do that? Let's see another example. In fact, the video game is a lot more fun than the film. And then this is the attention between the words, uh, to each of the words, and you introduce what is this attention map, how is this calculated, what is the transformer, what is QKB, then what is the attention map. And in this lecture, we just give you a high level idea. What is the relationship uh, of each word, like video and game? This is very heavily attended, okay? So video attend to game, game attend to video, okay? So this is showing the relationship attend, um, strength between uh, different words. You have N words here, you have N words here. This is the N by N matrix, which can grow pretty big. Okay. Um, and how do we uh, sort the importance of different tokens? And we can just sum up uh, the strength of uh, the attention in each column and then remove those smaller ones. Okay. For example, I is removed. The is removed, the is removed, the is removed, the period is removed. Okay, so finally, we are only left with that video game is a lot more fun than, um, than the uh, than film. Okay, so this is token pruning. So that our dream is to not only run large language model on these big monster giant servers, very expensive half a million dollar each, each node, but also run our laptops okay, in the cars, in robots, even in spaceships where there's no internet connection, right? Where we can preserve the data privacy when we are writing the code using the co-pilot service, okay? Like code completion, office, or even game chat, you can run it locally on the laptop, okay? The cars, robots, and more, okay? Actually, that is possible. So we are going to see a demo here. This is a MacBook Air, MacBook Air, uh, running the Lama 7 billion parameter model. Um, we ask the model to write a program to sort an integer array in C, and it's going to give me the actual C code uh, to sort an array. This is a pretty old MacBook. It's actually a MacBook Air, but actually the speed is reasonable. And this is achieved by compressing the model to four bits, okay? Um, and then use a design efficient inference engine to run directly on the four bit quantized model. This is the M1 chip. Yeah, it also works on Intel chip. So, the project is called Tiny Chat, and it's an open source project. Uh, feel free to download on, on uh, GitHub. GitHub.com, I'm at the Lab. Tiny Chat Engine takes about only 10 minutes to install on your laptop. And after this class, uh, our Lab 4 and Lab 5 will teach you the technique how to quantize the model, make the model smoother by using smooth quant and shift the quantization difficulty between activation and weight using uh, activation where weight only quantization to compress the model, that's lab, uh, lab four, okay? And then we have lab five to implement a fast, efficient inference engine um, 
in C++, I will teach you how to do parallel programming using a multi-threading using CMD, single instruction multiple data, um, using by taking advantage of cache locality uh, by using uh, loop and routing to remove those branching overhead, a lot of detailed system level hardcore techniques. So make sure you have some reasonable uh, C or C++ uh, coding experience. But I personally feel that's very easy to learn. Don't be afraid if you don't, uh, you, uh, don't take the class simply because you have never learned C. I feel you can learn it in a week. <laughs> and with that, okay, only with those low level programming language, you can deal with a lot of optimizations down to earth, like running large language model on an embedded device, uh, edge GPU like uh, JSON Ori. Okay, and now we can run a uh, Lama 2 uh, 7 billion parameter model at 30 tokens per second. Each token is taking only 30 milliseconds. We can ask you to uh, describe five attractions in the greater Boston area. It's gonna give you the answer at uh, about 30 tokens per second. We can also ask it to describe five attractions. Uh, this is the same, same demo. And we can even run a larger model, okay, Lama 2, 13 billion parameter model. And we are using here four bit weight 16-bit activation, we'll talk about what is that in the lecture, and we will talk about this technique, activation where weight only quantization, so that you can run it at 17 tokens per second. And we'll show the speed up using model compression and quantization. Okay, this is running on uh, 4090 GPU. Uh, the baseline model is without quantization, uh, 20 milliseconds, now it's only six milliseconds, okay, a lot more faster. And we can also actually make it a general purpose, not only run Llama, but also run MPT, Vulkan model and the CUDA model. If you're curious what they are, we'll introduce them in the lecture. Uh, what is um, the multi-head attention, multi-query attention, group query attention, what is the flash attention, what is the um, kernel fusion, what are the heavy cache pruning, all these techniques, these cool techniques. All right, so we are almost there. The next step is multi-model models. Okay, not only vision, not only language, but also combining vision, language, audio, action, put everything together, have a big foundation model to help us achieve a lot of amazing stuff. Okay, so let's first combine vision and language. Okay, so this model called LAVA can achieve general purpose vision and language understanding capability. Like uh, you can ask, do you know uh, who drew this painting? And Lava is going to say, the painting depicts a woman commonly believed to be Mona Lisa, the famous artwork from Leonardo da Vinci, etc. Okay, can understand the image and also give a language uh, description. So we want to compress these multi model models as well, right? Make it faster, make it smaller. So we want to quantize the four bit. So this is work from G, who can um, quantize the models only four bits but have better accuracy. For example, the baseline um, cannot tell who drew this uh, picture, but uh, using AWQ, using G's model, we can still uh, effectively tell it's uh, from Leonardo da Vinci, okay? And even given the second image, which contain both a text, okay? Sometimes it's just to look a picture of the earth from space and the marble and how beautiful it is, okay? So this is actually a word from Chick. Um, the uh, naive quantization using four bit, it loses accuracy. It says there are small pictures of the earth and other planets placed on top of the foot. But our model will teach you the technique, how to quantize it efficiently and smartly, lighthearted and humorous take on the concept of looking at pictures of the earth from space. Much better. And uh, we can also add an action besides the vision and language. So this is work from uh, Google called RT1. Um, the instructor is bring me the rice chips from the drawer. And it's currently opening the drawer. Now it's uh, having both the vision, this is what you see, and the language, this is the instruction, and also action.
slowly closing the tower <laughs> very carefully. <laughs> I mean, put down the rice chips. Okay? Pretty slow. I feel it's uh, running at three hertz. Okay, so this is actually fast forward by uh, four times faster. So it looks it looks good <laughs> for X speed. So that's uh, a big problem. But we're almost there, right? So it's almost doing the job. We just need to make it faster, and then we can have a large scale deployment. Um, this is due to the high computational costs and also the networking latency because this is transmitting the image and the, the scenario back to the server and then uh, use the um, use the Wi-Fi to communicate, which is having a pretty long latency. And that's why we need edge computing for uh, these robotics applications. Uh, hi, uh, what is that spinning thing? No, yeah, that's the LiDAR. Oh, we, LiDAR. Yeah, we introduced LiDAR point power. Right, and also deep learning for games, AlphaGo, beating Lee Sodo, everyone knows that. Uh, maybe we don't know is it's, it's actually taking 1900 uh, CPUs and 280 GPUs. Okay, each game um, is taking $3,000 just to pay for the electric bill per game. Very expensive. And also deep learning for scientific discovery, like um, AlphaFold, to review the structure of the protein, which the predictive model is actually very uh, similar to the um, ex actual uh, experimental result. Okay? But the compute is very heavy, uh, 128 uh, TPU V3 cores for a few weeks. So talking about that, we uh, covered a lot about algorithms, but actually there are actually three pillars that enabled the modern deep learning world. Well, so there are the algorithm which has existed uh, for the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, but modern hardware is really the driving force that made everything possible. Okay? And also large scale, large scale data set. So talking about hardware, let's switch here uh, to talk about to talk about these AI hardwares. Um, so this figure is showing. Uh, throughout the years, uh, we can see the number of transistors are keep growing, but the single thread performance is getting plateaued and frequency of a uh, CPU is also plateaued, okay? Uh, because we cannot afford higher power, it's going to burn everything. So people use um, multi-core to do parallel processing, okay? So parallel processing is really um, making a big impact for modern deep learning computing. Uh, especially uh, for GPU using GPUs. Okay, so this is the um, a talk from my digital advisor Bill David, um, showing the in eight computing uh, peak performance rather than in eight is growing exponentially, super fast, much faster than Moore's law for the past years. So there's plenty of room both at the top and also at the bottom for efficient deep Okay, so this is the um, 2012. 2014, when I was doing my PhD, uh, the K20 performing only about uh, four um, P ops per second of computing. And then um, the media introduced this uh, P16, uh, DP4A. Okay? So it's a dot product, four elements dot product. In one instruction, you can perform um, four dot products. Okay? And, and then introduced HMMA, which is half precision matrix multiplication and accumulation, HMMA uh, tensor core, which boosted the peak performance above 100 T ops per second. Okay. Um, and then we introduced integer matrix multiplication and accumulation, IMMA, which further boosted the performance. And then uh, A100 introduced uh, structural sparsity, which we'll cover in this lecture. What is uh, sparsity, what is structured sparsity that further boosted uh, the int 8 performance. So, um, this talk, this presentation, and also this lecture will focus on the software innovations and software hardware co design. And here we want to highlight how important it is 
the modern technology mode from uh, seven nanometer all the way to five nanometer, the portion of the software is getting quite important. We will introduce a lot of software techniques uh, that is hardware aware that can boost uh, the hardware e efficiency. So let's continue to see um, the trend and the growth of modern deep learning computing starting with cloud and then followed by uh, edge AI hardware. Okay, so in 2016, AMIGA introduced a P100 um, and then uh, we 100 A100, recently H100. And now these are back ordered by the next year, very difficult to get. And we can see actually the dense IP16 performance is growing really fast from uh, like 18 uh, T ops, T ops per second. Uh, this stands for Terra, Terra operations per second, okay, all the way to almost uh, a thousand T ops per second, which is a dense IP16 uh, performance. But that is not a single point of interest we are have to evaluate, right? So peak performance does not always translate to measure the speed up, right? So there's another bottleneck, which is the memory bandwidth, okay? Uh, in the lecture, we'll introduce how to calculate how many flops to use in um, a neural network in the next lecture. And also we'll introduce how to calculate the size of the activation, just using a pen and pencil to calculate how much memory you need. Uh, so actually the, the, the memory is actually growing at a slightly slower speed compared with compute, right? Computation is relatively cheap, but memory movement, data movement is much more expensive. So, so uh, most of the time, the memory bandwidth is the limit bottleneck. That's why we need to compress the model, compress the activations. But the physical size of the physical size of the GPU is roughly um, this big, oh, wow. and the width is roughly this big. Um, if you're interested, we'll give you a lab tour to the basement. We'll show you how those GPUs look like. Uh, okay, all right. And then we can see, continue to see the power. Right? Uh, these are not free lunch. We have to pay a lot of power. It's getting very, uh, very hot. Luckily, we are in Boston. <laughs> but it's still burning like 700 watts, just one single GPU. And if you stack eight of them together, um, that's like 5,000 uh, watts, not to mention the CPUs, the memories, everything together may uh, as well go above 10,000 watts. And this is the size of the memory, right? As you can see from A100 to H100, such a very marginal uh, size increase. So computation here, computation is cheap, increasing super fast, three times, okay? Memory is expensive, memory is expensive. So with that in mind, one of the key principles for efficient different computing. Compute is cheap, memory is expensive. All right, so um, those large GPUs can be used for inference and also training in the cloud. What about on the edge? How about like running on the phones, right? So I'll introduce some edge device hardware, for example, the Qualcomm um, Snapdragon series, okay? Snapdragon 855, 888, and Agent 1. And the latest one is actually the Agent 2. It's actually having a really high performance, the peak performance measured in TOPS, right? Um, the power is around 10 watts, okay, around 10 watts. And here the memory is about 16 gigabytes. And the agent one actually runs less than 50 um, at a, about 0 0.8 milliseconds for single batch 224 inference, which is actually pretty pretty fast. Um, when I uh, was in PhD, ResNet was introduced in 2016. At that time, it was considered a pretty big model. It has 25 million parameters, takes 100 megabytes in a P32, um, pretty slow to run. But recently with this algorithm hardware, everything co-designed, it runs about less than one millisecond on a Snapdragon Gen Y on the phone. Pretty exciting. And also the Apple uh, neural engine, they all have specialized hardware uh, called AIAE Apple neural engine. 
uh, high throughput, uh, high performance for AI, AI inference. Uh, I can run about 16 tyro, uh, tyro ops per second. Um, don't be confused why it has a lot less compared to Qualcomm's because the peak performance does not always translate to measure the speed up. We'll see that in the lecture. It's a little bit more power efficient, six to eight watts. Um, the memory is a bit slower, but by our algorithm and hardware co-design, not necessarily uh, lower memory means lower performance. The media has also a bunch of uh, edge devices uh, called Jetson series, uh, including uh, Jetson Nano, Jetson Ori Nano, Jetson AGX, Jane Xavier, and Jetson, uh, Jetson Ori. Uh, actually, they have a pretty um, impressive number of peak performance, almost 200, 300 TOPS per second. Um, here is showing the power from, uh, from 10 watts to 60 watts. It's suitable for like robotics applications, uh, autonomous driving applications. The Ori platform is very widely used in a lot of modern EV, uh, EV uh, electric vehicles. And memory is up to like 64 gigabytes. Okay, if you think about um, the Lama 70 billion parameter model, uh, without quantization, it cannot fit the 64 gigabyte of memory. But after the uh, four bit quantization, which we are going to learn, we can actually deploy a Lama, Lama 70 billion parameter model in a JSON ring. Uh, so also Google has this uh, TPU, edge TPU for TOPS per second, only two watts, very energy efficient, about eight gigabytes of memory. Another type of AI inference hardware is the FPGA, where uh, Xilinx has a bunch of energy efficient designs, about a couple of TOPS per second, uh, 10 to 50 watts, uh, four to 16 gigabytes of memory. You can program, program them. They are a few programmable data arrays um, that offers flexibility, a lot more flexibility. And also we have this microcontroller that is much smaller, just a few dollars you can buy, uh, buy them. Okay? They are um, super power efficient, like uh, only uh, the units switch from watts to milliwatts, and the memory is even switched from gigabytes to kilobytes. Last year, we had uh, projects to teach students how to deploy neural networks on microcontrollers. But this year, due to the, uh, the capacity, we only have 30 devices. So we decided to make that optional. Uh, so we have an open-ended project. If you are interested in deploying a neural network on one of these microcontrollers, feel free to talk to me. I can give you one of those sites. Uh, basically, that's the level four for last year which we replaced with large language model, which you can use your laptop to run it. So we'll cover the entire spectrum from cloud AI using GPUs, 800, uh, 800 80 gigabyte, 100 GPU, to mobile AI, how to deploy uh, models on mobile phone, how to with the tiny AI, IoT devices, tiny little microcontrollers, only one megabyte of flash. Okay, so that completes. The three pillar. So conventionally, deep learning require a lot of computation, a lot more, a lot of carbon, uh, many engineers, a lot of data to train. After taking this lecture, you will learn how to make a use less computing, less carbon, greener, okay, and require fewer engineers and less data to train. Okay, so this is the course overview. Um, every Thursday, uh, Tuesday and Thursday, 3.30 to 5 exactly at the same classroom. Um, the office hour is Thursday after the class, exactly after this class in our lab at 38, 3.44, feel free to visit us. And we have this uh, Discord channel um, for, I know young folks like Discord, so we try to be fashionable to use Discord rather than Piazza. Um, uh, TAs and me will answer the questions on, on Discord. Um, homework submission um, can now submit on Discord. We'll use can Canvas for homework submissions. And you may like this. All the lectures will be streamed on YouTube. So you, uh, you're very encouraged to come to the classroom. We have more interactions, right? But we also want to be considerate. If you cannot make it, 
we make it available on YouTube. You can also refer to your friends uh, to see uh, to watch it together. Lots of resources, uh, especially on our GitHub. All the demos we have seen uh, that is generated from our lab is available on GitHub. It's open source. You can run it on your laptop. Show your friend HandyML and Zunet, Smooth Quant. Uh, this has been actually landed in media pro products already, which is pretty exciting, give you an idea how to transfer the research into products. Um, if someone is um, like the class, we even have uh, more advanced uh, hardware platforms for you to train the model and run inference. Uh, you can contact us at Discord, and also uh, we have a mailing list. Uh, you can sign up here to join our mailing list to get notified. And these are some of the uh, final open-ended projects you can uh, we have about 10 uh, we have about five uh, Qualcomm phones and also five Qualcomm Geran board which you can use you can borrow uh, to uh, run some of your uh, projects um, and also we have a couple of uh, Jensen devices microcontrollers and Raspberry Pis uh, for you to run home uh, to run the open-ended project okay we'll start with efficient inference. Okay, also uh, followed by efficient training, followed by op application specific optimizations, focusing on LLM and AIGC, and a little bit on video and also point cloud. It will be a combination of system and also algorithm. And it will be an intersection between EECS and AI plus D, lots of neural network machine learning knowledge, um, lots of computer science knowledge, how to write efficient code, efficient kernel, low by rolling compiler, um, and also e knowledge like using uh, embedded systems, microcontrollers, et cetera, hiring power, et cetera. And, um, and the prerequisite, which I don't think we have prerequisite because I believe self-learning, right? You can learn everything by yourself. <laughs> so when I do the startup, I have no prerequisite. I know nothing. Everything is learned from practice. But uh, if you ask me about prerequisite, I would say the computational structures, you really want to uh, learn this knowledge, like you have basic knowledge, what is CMD, what is the cache, what is the branch predictor. If you haven't learned this, we'll come to check out the textbook and learn by yourself, or even what, watch it on YouTube. YouTube is a very good teacher. <laughs> and also the introduction to machine learning. So you have to know what is backpropagation, what is a neural network, what is the activation function, uh, what is SGD, for example, uh, those are the basics. And here are also some related courses you can take uh, to help you um, uh, um, get the knowledge more um, solid. We'll have 23 lectures every Tuesday and Thursday, 90 minutes each, 10 minute break, five to 10 minute break. One guest lecture uh, in the end to show you how um, uh, industry is working in this direction, give you a real world um, uh, eye opening uh, guest lecture. Five lab assignments, uh, pruning, uh, quantization, neural architecture search, and also large language model, together with one final project that can be done with two or three students, uh, including a proposal, presentation, demo, written report, and there will be no final exam. We believe everything is learned through practice. So just do the project. So part one is about efficient inference. We'll talk about pruning, uh, reducing parameters, making sparse, quantization using lower precision, neural architecture search, making hardware friendly, and also knowledge distillation, teacher-student model. Uh, the second chapter is about application-specific optimizations. We we'll give a deep dive into what is a transformer? What is a tension? what is a large language model? And we have spent two lectures on that. And then we are going to talk about vision transformers, which is getting a lot of momentum, like the uh, segment anything that, uh, that is based on uh, vision transformer. Then we'll talk, talk about GAN video and point cloud uh, for autonomous driving. We have seen this in the, in the car and also diffusion models and how to make them faster. Next chapter, we'll talk about efficient training. How do we do distributed training using a lot of GPUs, model parallelism, data parallelism, pipeline parallelism? Spent two lectures on that distributed training. 
Um, and also talk about on-device training, given your phone, given a microcontroller, how do we do fine tuning and reduce the memory, reduce the computation on, on these devices. And finally, we'll give a very short introduction about quantum machine learning. So five labs. Uh, lab one is not graded. It just give you a brief introduction how to use PyTorch, which our TA will introduce uh, in the uh, next lecture. And uh, lab one is about pruning. Lab two is about composition. We are going to use Google Colab, um, which I encourage you to set it up uh, by having a Google account and set up Google Colab. Neural architecture search. Lab four and five are related to LLM how to compress the LM, turning a large llama into a small llama. <laughs> so it can fit your laptop and develop tiny chat so that you can show your mom or, or your dad. You can run large language model locally on your laptop. It'll be a fun class. This is the final project from last year. Like AI role, uh, one of my classmates, cl uh, one of my students actually uh, try to uh, recognize he's in the um, rowing team. So he's doing a rowing related project. This is another project that actually turned into an ICML paper that was presented in Hawaii, uh, this Juan, and also got integrated into Amiga products, which is super cool, smooth quant, quantizing uh, large language models and a bunch of interesting open-ended projects. So it can have a lot of potential impacts, um, large language model, generative AI, autonomous driving system, tiny ML. We laid the foundation to compress these models, make them run faster and have a bunch of interesting applications. All right, with that, I will conclude today's lecture. Hope you like it. Um, and we'll see you again next Tuesday. Thank you.